It's the Great Easter Debate. Cancel the Resurrection. With Brian Edwards, Bill Craig, and your host, Tim Dower, on News Talk ZB. Good morning, News Talks are at uh, six and a bit past eleven. Between now and midday, cancel the resurrection hour debate. Possibly you would say the most fantastic event, if indeed uh, it was an event, ever to have taken place on earth, if indeed it did take place. The sequence of occurrences that we celebrate at Easter, the crucifixion and the alleged resurrection of Christ, the foundation the cornerstone, if you like, of the Christian faith. But the story is so fantastic that there have always been and will always be doubters, detractors. And today we will hear both sides of this argument. You too will have an opportunity to decide for yourself and to indicate by telephone vote who you believe has won the argument, cancel the resurrection. Did it or did it not take place? With me in Auckland this morning, radio and television journalist, philosopher, observer of the human condition, raconteur, wit, and sometimes Waiheke Island resident, uh, Dr. Brian Edwards. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's great to see you. Oh, it's lovely to be here, absolutely. Usually I used to be on Saturday mornings working downstairs, but no windows, no city to look at. This is much more swept up. Oh, well, and as it should be. For, as it should be. For an auspicious occasion. Uh, from the United States, so people will be very familiar with you, Brian, but from the United States... Uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Bill Craig joins us, and uh, we thank you as well for joining us, Bill. How are you? Good morning, Tim. It's uh, beautiful here in Atlanta, and uh, bring you greetings, and uh, hello to you too, Brian. Good morning, Bill. Very nice to talk to you. Before we get into it, Bill, would you mind filling us in a little bit on your own background, a little bit about yourself? Sure. I think for this debate, the most relevant thing would be my research into the resurrection of Jesus as an event of, of history. I was a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in West Germany, working with the world-renowned scholar Wolfhard Pannenberg at the University of Munich, and uh, did uh, my doctoral dissertation on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus, and then have uh, published a number of books in this area. And um, I'm a research professor currently at Talbot School of Theology, which is in Southern California. All right, so your, your mind has uh, clearly made up. Your mind has been poisoned from an early age with this, this, this no, mythical not notion. At all. Not, not at all. Not from an early age. I wasn't raised in a church-going family or, or a Christian home. Uh, I came to believe this later in life, and I, I'm speaking of my work that I did and my doctoral studies. So I, I don't come from this sort of background. Do you come from an agnostic background? No, no, I, this is very interesting that, that Bill comes from that background. I come from the opposite background. I was a, hmm. an only child of a solo mother. My mother was a very strong believer in, uh, uh, in Christianity. It provided a great solace and comfort to her throughout her life. So I've, I've, never, I've never wanted to discourage anyone else from believing. I am interested in the argument, of course. Uh, but I know that religion was terribly important to my mother. And when my mother died, I remember finding... Uh, around her bedside, all the little quotations from the Bible, which she'd obviously used as a comfort in her uh, in her later years. Uh, but it was at university that uh, uh, I came to the conclusion. I was actually in the church choir. Uh, I was the Sunday school superintendent, and I, I suddenly found I couldn't believe this anymore. And so there was often my career of that's the word as an atheist. So by a peculiar quirk of fate, we have two turncoats. <laughs> turncoats. <laughs> yes, 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 uh, and of course, the, the, the role of the turncoat in the event cannot be ignored. No, uh, actually, I almost came to believe in God this morning, Bill, or actually last night, because I made a few notes for this debate, and we have two rather lovely uh, Burmese cats. And uh, I was heading for bed last night and discovered that one of our cats had eaten all my notes. Oh. So I thought this, is, this could be this could be the hand of God. <laughs> uh, but for the for the moment, uh, you're sticking with your position. Absolutely. For the proposition uh, that the re resurrection of Jesus occurred, uh, Dr. Bill Craig is with us from Atlanta, Georgia, against that proposition. Dr. Brian Edwards is with me here in Auckland. Later in the morning, I'm not going to give it now, but later in the morning, at around about quarter to midday, I will give you a number. You can make a call for seventy five cents. Uh, and make your uh, decision, make your choice in this debate. Please try not to be prejudiced. This is one reason we're not giving you the number now. Just tell us who's won the debate. And that may 
uh, go against your preconceived notions. So an 0900 number to come at around about a quarter to midday. Ground rules, five minutes each. An initial opening address of five minutes to each party. Phil Guy, our producer, has even gone to the trouble of acquiring a stopwatch uh, for this. Uh, so important is it that we, we, we conduct this event as fairly as we possibly can. And that's a tricky one for me, let me tell you. We're coming round to 12 minutes after 11. So I'll ask you, Bill, to open the debate with your support of this proposition. All right. Well, Tim, New Testament scholars today are engaged in an ongoing quest of the historical Jesus. And our interest today is in particular what happened to Jesus after his crucifixion. How reliable are the New Testament accounts? And I want to make basically two points tonight. First of all, that any adequate historical hypothesis about Jesus' fate has to explain four established facts which are accepted by the majority of New Testament critics today. Jesus' honorable burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Now, let me say just a word about each of these. First of all, fact number one is that after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. This first fact is highly significant because it means that the location of Jesus' tomb was known. And in that case, the disciples could never have proclaimed his resurrection in Jerusalem if that tomb had not been empty. Uh, so according to the late uh, New Testament scholar of Cambridge University, John A.T. Robinson, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Second fact is that on the Sunday morning following the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Um, according to Jakob Kramer, who is an Austrian specialist in the resurrection, and I quote, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Third fact is that on multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament critics today. Even Gerhard Ludemann, a, a very skeptical German New Testament scholar, uh, concludes with these words, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. And finally, the fourth fact is that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation the disciples faced after Jesus' crucifixion. First of all, their leader was dead, and Jews had no belief in a dying Messiah. Secondly, according to Jewish law, Jesus' execution as a criminal showed him out to be a heretic, a man literally under the curse of God. And thirdly, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anybody's rising from the dead before the general resurrection at the end of the world. And nevertheless, these original disciples suddenly came to believe in and were willing to go to their deaths for the fact of Jesus' resurrection. N.T. Wright, who is a prominent British New Testament scholar, has said if nothing happened after Jesus' death, then any first century Jew would have said that he was another deluded fanatic. That is why, Wright concludes, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. So I think we have good historical grounds for these four central facts. Jesus' honorable burial, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And these are recognized as belonging to the historical Jesus by the majority of New Testament critics who have written on this subject today. Well, that leads me to the second main point that I want to make, and that is I believe that the best explanation of these four facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In his book, uh, Justifying Historical Descriptions, the historian C.B. McCullough 
lists tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for historical facts. And I think that the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all of these tests. They include things like, number one, explanatory scope, two, explanatory power, three, plausibility, four, uh, not being ad hoc or, or contrived, uh, fifth, being in accord with accepted beliefs, and six, outstripping any rival theory in meeting these first uh, five criteria. And uh, it seems to me that the resurrection hypothesis meets these criteria better than any naturalistic explanation that's been proposed. And therefore, I think we have good historical grounds for believing in the resurrection of Christ. And that's your five minutes opening address. Bill Craig from Atlanta, Georgia, if you're just joining us now, cancel the resurrection. This is our Easter debate between now and midday. Uh, Bill and here in Auckland uh, with me, uh, Dr. Brian Edwards will discuss this proposition, the cornerstone, if you wish, of the Christian faith. If it did not occur, then what are two billion people doing <laughs> occasional Sunday? I should also mention that there's cash involved. At the end of this event, we will award $2,001 to the charity of the winner's choice. You, the listener, choose the winner. I'll give you an 0900 number to vote on. That was Bill Craig's opening address in support of the proposition. I'll ask uh, Dr. Brian Edwards now to respond to that. Five minutes. I suppose you could ask the question, what are an even greater number of people doing not going to church this Sunday? Because those are where the figures would take you. And I think there's a very great danger in uh, trying to decide these matters numerically by saying, you know, well, there were all these millions of people who believed this and who founded churches and put up buildings and all the rest, and therefore it must be true. Um, I don't think you can go really go very sensibly down that path. And I think if you go down that path, you tend to lose the argument anyway. Uh, you can't, of course, discuss this really without discussing whether, discussing whether God exists. And I guess that's something we'll get round to uh, a little later in the, in the morning. Uh, as to the resurrection and uh, the evidence that Bill points to, um, I think you have to be very careful with language. All through his little talk there, Bill talked about facts. Uh, I don't regard any of these things as facts. He also talked about the universality of uh, uh, scholarship and criticism on this. Well, of course, it isn't universal at all. But vast numbers of people uh, don't accept these propositions whatsoever. But if you just look at the thing, you have a situation where for uh, tens of thousands of years and, and well beyond that, uh, no one rose from the dead. It never happened before. I think probably Bill would agree with that. And, and now we've had another 2,000 years uh, going since when it also hasn't happened. Uh, no one has risen from the dead. There's absolutely no sign of anyone rising from the dead. So you have to say, well, this, this seems to go against everything we know uh, about what happens in life. People do not rise from the dead. So are we going to believe that this one man rose from the dead and under what sort of evidence? And the evidence uh, is not the sort of evidence uh, that Bill puts forward that m most of us think of as evidence. Most of us think of evidence as empirical evidence, things we can see, hear, feel, touch, uh, know happened because we saw pictures of them, whatever it might be. And none of the evidence that Bill has put forward comes into that category. It's, I suppose, what you might call hearsay evidence, the sort of evidence, of course, that wouldn't be accepted in any court. Uh, the argument is that a lot of people have said this happened, uh, that it is written about in the Bible. Uh, that this man died, that he was put in a tomb, that the tomb was found empty, that people saw him uh, after his death, and then on and on that he ascended into heaven, and so on and so forth. But I describe this as hearsay. Uh, this is second-hand evidence, if you like, of what people believed. And those people who believed these things and wrote these things had an enormous vested interest in them being true, didn't they? Uh, they had followed this man. They were his disciples. He had offered the most extraordinary hope. Uh, that death would be conquered, uh, that sin would be conquered, that uh, those of us, I guess, who behaved well would end up in, in heaven uh, with him. And, and so uh, they were faced with the most extraordinary disappointment that this turned out not to be true. And so I, I take the position that one has to have some better evidence than saying this is in a book, uh, even if you believe that the book was divinely inspired. You have to have some better evidence to say a whole lot of people say this happened and I believe them. And, and so my view is that this is highly improbable. I, I've seen Bill debate uh, on video on this subject and he starts off by um, putting a false construction on atheism. Uh, he says that the atheist has to prove 
that there is no God and the atheist has to prove that these things never happened. And that, of course, is quite incorrect. It's a distortion of the atheist position. As an atheist, I simply say, I don't believe this. Uh, I think the probabilities are against it. Uh, I can see no evidence of God. Uh, I can't see God around me. Uh, he doesn't seem to wish to make himself uh, apparent or transparent uh, to the rest of us. And so I don't think God exists, and everything else follows from that, of course. And, uh, but I think that the atheist who says, I know there is no God, is a fool, uh, in much the same way as I think the person who says, I know there is a God, is being, in my, in my view, misguided and possibly foolish. So I don't really need my, <laughs> need, need my five minutes. I look out the window, if you like, and I say, uh, is there a God? Well, if there is, where is he? You look out the window and you don't see evidence of God. I don't see evidence of God. I know, I know Bill does. He sees a design, evidence. but that's for him to tell you, not me. Right. I am, of course, an impartial in this uh, debate, and I should remind myself uh, of, uh, of that fact. News Talk Seppi, and we are debating the resurrection. Did it really happen? Did the, uh, was it possible uh, that a man could die, that a man could be seen to be dead, and days later could come back to life? Uh, the proof... Uh, as Christians would uh, would have it, uh, that there is a God that Jesus was, in mm. fact, the Son of God. That is the assertion that we're discussing. You've actually got to go beyond that, and um, I'm sure you'll want to come to Bill again, but you've got to go beyond that to look at this as a scenario and, and to say, what sort of scenario is this? I find the scenario bizarre and actually quite repulsive. Uh, you have this, this, this idea that um, at the beginning of things, and Bill, I think, will tell you that he believes that God is the creator of the universe, that at the beginning of things you have God, and who knows what God is these days, Christians can't agree on it, God is sort of wandering around there in nothingness, uh, and decides to, the universe, put man in the universe, presumably being omniscient, knows that this design is flawed and things are going to go wrong, one might have thought that at that point, but however, uh, creates man, man then turns his face against God, uh, and sends himself down to earth, uh, uh, to redeem man by having his son crucified on our behalf. And I've got to say that even if this were true, it is such a bizarre, to the point of being sadistic scenario, that I wouldn't want to. It. Your God is a sadist, but no. all twisted, uh, bizarre, and you can see where Brian is coming uh, from. I, I, think, I think not. Uh, on the Christian view, it's just the marvelous story of the incarnation and redemption wrought by God himself. It is God's self-giving love that he himself would take upon himself the death penalty of sin that we as humans deserve so that we could be redeemed, forgiven, and brought to worship with himself. So that the thing that Brian finds bizarre and in incredible, I find beautiful and a, a wonderful example to us, a model to us of the kind of self-giving lives that yourselves ought to lead. Right. But if I could respond to some of the points Brian has made, I'd, I'd like, like to, to do that. Before we go too far down that track, I'd like to come back to the empirical evidence mm -hmm. as you see it. I mean, your basic assumption, really, that any of this is true is what Brian challenged. That any of this took place. Yes, that's right. And Where are your facts? My facts are uh, historical facts, and I think that's what Brian needs to come to grips with. When we do the study of history, by its very nature, the events themselves are gone. They're in the past. They're no longer empirically accessible to the five senses. It's not like science. So the historian attempts to reconstruct the course of the past based upon evidence. And one of the most important kinds of evidence for the historian, in addition to, say, archaeological remains which are tangible, will be testimonial evidence. And uh, if you apply Brian's sort of skepticism across the board, you might as well close all the history departments at the university, certainly the departments of ancient history. For example, we have no first-hand writings from Socrates. We know of Socrates from the accounts of him given by uh, Plato, for example, and other writers. Um, yes, Bill, yet, but Bill, if I could just interrupt you there, we're not making fantastical claims about Socrates. We're not, right. we're, not, we're not saying that Socrates died, was put in a tomb, rose again from the dead, and, w and went to be 
in heaven with God. I mean, th these are fantastical claims that are being made here. Not What's like the that? claim simply that a man existed or, or wrote some philosophical works. This is rather different, surely. That's, that's correct, but that gets over to your other point about miracles and the probability of miracles. In, insofar as though your concern with empirical evidence is concerned, the fact is that New Testament historians are operating on all fours along with other ancient historians, for example, of Greco-Roman history. And facts like that Jesus was buried honorably by Joseph of Arimathea is not in and of itself fantastic or supernatural. The fact that his tomb was found empty uh, is not in and of itself a supernatural or, or bizarre fact. So that these are questions that historians can ask and need to address. And as I say, most who have written on this subject agree with those four facts that I mentioned, that Jesus was buried by Joseph in a tomb, that that tomb was found empty, that the disciples experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead thereafter, and that they suddenly and sincerely came to believe in the resurrection. Now, the question is, what's the best explanation? And what you want to do, Brian, is to say that it can't be a miraculous explanation because other people haven't risen from the dead. People don't rise from the dead. Well, all that shows is that if this happened, it wasn't a natural event. It would have to have been supernatural. In other words, it would have had to have been a miracle. Yes, but and I will think this argument goes in a circle. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, this all. argument is tautologist. It runs around in a circle. It says, well, explain the circle to us. Well, I explain the circle to you. You say, right, okay. Um, my argument is that, that, that this is against everything that we know. It is a bizarre event. It goes against all, our, all empirical evidence. And you say, yes, but, but hold on uh, a, a minute. Uh, this, is a bit, this is a bit different no. because, because this, this man was the son of God. And that's no, no, why no, I say no, the argument no. runs in a circle. Bill, no, would, no, it, would you let Brian just finish his argument? Well, I mean, I think, I, I think fundamentally, fundamentally that's, that is it. There are no miracles. Uh, none of us experience miracles. All these things have explanations. And no. I don't doubt for a moment there were explanations of uh, why these people s thought they saw these things, desperately wanted to believe these things, and did so. But Well, no, but they didn't. That was my fourth point, is that they came to believe in this event despite having every predisposition to the contrary. The idea that Jesus would be risen from the dead is so un-Jewish and outrageous that the historian has to come up with some sort of a sufficient cause for these men coming to sincerely believe this. But let me address the, the miracles point. Because I want to submit that what our scientific evidence tells us is that people do not rise naturally from the dead. And I agree with that 100%. The idea that Jesus came back to life spontaneously and naturally is absurd. Any hypothesis would be more reasonable than that. But that is not my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And you can exclude that only if you know that God does not exist. And in that respect, I do agree with Brian. Only if you have a proof of atheism can you rule out the miraculous in advance. There can, but there can, but this, the is a, this bill is the distortion of atheism that I talked about earlier. There can be no proof that God does then not exist. Then you have to be open no, to the possibility of miracles, don't you, Brian? Yes, you, you do, and I am. And I am open to okay. the possibility of the, well, exist, of the existence of you. All right. Well, what it would take to convince me is the same sort of empirical evidence that I have for everything else. If someone comes into me in the studio this morning and says there is an elephant with five heads in Queen Street, which is a street here in Auckland, I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to say, I, I, I have no experience of that. I've never seen an elephant with five heads. No one has ever, uh, has ever photographed an elephant with five heads. Show it to me. And if the person can't show it to me or demonstrate in some reasonable way, providing some sort of empirical justification for that, I'm going to say, you're nuts. And, right. now, and what about uh, yeah. a historical event, though, where you do not have immediate empirical access to it because the event occurred in the past? What kind of evidence would you do? Yes, but you're, you're not surely going to suggest to me, Bill, that God existed only in the past. No, no. Uh, the, God is not a historical event in, in your submission of it. Of no, God exists now. Oh, we agree right. that God exists now in your scheme yes, of things. Where is he? What I, what I want to ask, though, is I want to see... Now, can you answer that? Well, where is God now? If he exists now, where is he? Well, the why is he hidden? Well, I don't think he is hidden. I think that God is revealed in Scripture and the Bible. He's revealed but you've gone history. back to the past again, Bill. Where is he now? 
Well, now do you mean that literally? He's not anywhere because God transcends space. He's a, he, he is outside but the he, space. But, but he exists. If you will. You believe he exists. Yes, God yes. exists, but he Where is the evidence of his existence? existence? Oh, well, now that's a quite different question. I would say the evidence of his existence would be things, for example, like the origin of the universe at a point in the finite past, the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe for intelligent life, the existence of objective moral values in the world, the existence of uh, non-physical minds in the world, the immediate experience of God, all of these provide evidence of his existence. Yes, could we, could we deal is, with those one by one then? Would well, that... yes, but, but let me make my general point, and that Save is me. that yeah. the, as long as you have no evidence for atheism, you have to be open to the possibility that God exists and therefore to the possibility of miracles. And so I want to know what standard of evidence would lead you to think that an event in the past was a miracle, was an act of God. What would it take to convince you? Well, I, I think that uh, what all of us do when we look at events in the past, uh, we relate them to our current life experience. And we say, yeah, I'm perfectly happy to believe that um, someone did this or someone did that, that Columbus discovered America, this makes sense to me because there is a place called America, and so on and so forth. But when someone uh, wants me to believe something that is against all my current uh, understanding and knowledge, then I'm going to say, sorry, I need something better than that. Now, if we, if we just come to you, to the first of the points that you made, you, you believe, as I understand it, that uh, God... Uh, is the creator of the universe. And I think that you... Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, fine. here. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think um, you've, you're on record as saying that there is... Uh, uh, atheists tend to, to argue that the world, the universe has existed forever, and you said, well, this is impossible. Uh, it, it must have started somewhere, and God designed and created the universe. I, faced with that, want to ask the child's question, where did God come from? Who made God? Because well, I think what tends to happen here is that uh, the atheist says, well, I don't really understand how all this started. I just sort of assume it's been around forever. The Christian says, no, no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, God must have started things. And then my children say to me, oh, hold on a minute, where did God come from? Who made God? And I think we're just back to the same point again. Well, I, I don't think so. I think that question isn't hard to answer. The current astrophysical evidence indicates that all matter and energy and physical space and time themselves came into being at the Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. And therefore, if this event has a cause, that cause must be a timeless and spaceless being which transcends all matter and energy, space and time, and therefore simply exists timelessly. And once you understand the concept of a timeless, spaceless being, you can see that the child's question is a meaningless question. It, it's like asking, why is it that all bachelors are unmarried? Why, why don't we find any married bachelors? Well, because the very concept of a timeless, spaceless being entails that such a being is uncaused. But, but that to, me, to me, that is just so fantastical, because uh, how this argument runs is that you say, well, uh, there has to be a cause for the beginning of the universe, yes. and you say, and the cause is God, and then you say that God himself is uncaused. Uh, so you are not willing to accept the concept of an uncaused universe, which at least we know exists, well, but yes. you are willing to accept the concept of an uncaused God that we don't know exists. Can we? Uh, no, I would be willing to accept the concept of an uncaused universe if the universe were eternal in the past. But you see, the point is that contemporary astrophysical cosmology shows that the universe is finite in its existence. It has not always been, and therefore its coming into being cries out for a cause, for an explanation, in, a, in an uncaused cause which exists timelessly and never came into existence, never came into being. So what has so happened is that we've had to invent that cause, which would essentially be the atheist position, that we have invented cause. No, it's, a, it's an inference from two premises. The pre first premise is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. The second premise is that the universe began to exist, and it follows deductively and inescapably from those two premises, if they're true, that therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. Well, I think that we're closer to agreement when you use the word it's an inference. Uh, I agree it is an inference. I think all of this is an inference, but right. an inference, the is, an inference is, the... is not evidence. 
Yes, it is. If, uh, no, I mean, it's not. An inference is not evidence. No, but... As a philosopher, I'm sure you would agree that an inference is not evidence. No, an inference is an argument which is based on evidence. What it, evidence is the evidence for the premises of the argument. It are true. The conclusion follows logically. So the only way you can avoid the conclusion is by showing that one of the premises is false. So which one do you think is false? Well, you and, you and I could go home today and, and, be, and be in absolute agreement and all that that would require would be for God to show himself. I'm, I'm always intrigued yeah. by the idea of God as father, which is constantly put forward. And here you have a most unusual father. You have a father who is hidden in the cupboard for at least 2,000 years, and for more or less an eternity before that, who doesn't wish to reveal himself to his children, which I, which I find uh, quite extraordinary. You, you, earlier, I think you, you talked, uh, talking about the resurrection, you said something about uh, uh, original sin. Uh, and you talked about the depth of original sin that we had fallen into for which we deserve to be punished. And then in the same uh, phrase, you talked about the love of God. I would reject this. If, if God existed, I would reject God as less good, less just, less loving, less caring than I would be as a father because I would not deal with my children the way God has dealt with his. How, how do you think God has dealt with his children that is unloving? What do you mean? Well, what is it that Jesus in the resurrection was saving us from? From our own evil. And, what, and what, would the, what would the outcome of our evil be? Why did we need to be saved from it? Well, because we find ourselves morally guilty, morally culpable before a holy and righteous God. When we're born? Mm -hmm. I think that's something on which Christian theologians disagree. I well, would like most need to debate. I didn't mention, in fact, original sin, but I think every one of us admits that we've done and said and thought things that were not right. You, uh, you, I do have children, Bill. Oh yes. But do you do you remember looking at your babies when they were just born? Yes. And, and how, what a joyous experience that was. And did you think they were sinful? I, I'm sure that wasn't going through my mind at the time. No. But, but even, even in retrospect, even in retrospect, no. <laughs> you know, well, they I've might be not teenagers now. <laughs> yes, no, and, and, and and I've been to hell us, as well. Yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. All of us who are adults, I think, recognize our moral failures and and our moral shortcomings. And if God exists, we find ourselves morally responsible and accountable to Him. And uh, and and this is what the resurrection of Jesus and the cross offers us is forgiveness and moral cleansing and reconciliation with a loving God. So uh, that's why I was puzzled when you said the way God has dealt with his children. I think he's dealt marvelously. He's, he's given of his own life in the person of Jesus to reconcile us to himself. No father could do better. All right. I want to uh, cut in at that point because it's 20 minutes away from the end of our program at midday. And thank you both for the intensity uh, of, uh, of that discussion and, and for uh, the application. Uh, I, I hope you followed it. It's been fascinating um, to follow the argument. We will open uh, our 0900 vote line in about five minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of the program for some closing address, but I think to pull us all back into uh, the, key, the question that we're asking here, the resurrection, did it or did it not happen? I would like each of you uh, to, to give me a couple of minutes before we open that vote line up on your side of the argument. I'd like, Bill, just to revise uh, across uh, your side of that and, and Brian as well. Uh, so set it up for us, if you will, uh, Bill, what, what happened, how it happened, what proof you want to offer or, or, or how to win your side of the argument if you like and, and then we'll give Brian a couple of minutes as well before we open up the vote lines then we can get back into some more discussion of this All right. Okay, Bill. Um, if the resurrection of Jesus actually occurred as an event of history it's not the sort of thing you would expect to have much evidence for and yet it's all the more remarkable therefore that we do have the majority of New Testament historians agreeing on these four facts about the fate of Jesus that I think are best explained by the resurrection. Namely, the majority of critics who have written on this subject believe that Jesus was honorably buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, that that tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on Sunday morning, 
and that thereafter individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. And finally, number four, that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead, despite having every predisposition as Jews to believe in such a thing. Now, it is remarkable and incredible that these four facts represent uh, what the majority of New Testament critics believe about the historical Jesus. Now, I think the best explanation for these is that God raised him from the dead. And when I compare to alternative explanations, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, or they hallucinated, none of these, it seems to me, has the same sort of explanatory power and scope and plausibility as the resurrection. The only reason Brian really seems to me to oppose the resurrection is because it's a miraculous explanation. But you can only exclude miraculous explanations if you know first that God does not exist. Otherwise, you've got to be open to them. And I certainly don't think that there's any good uh, argument or reason to think that God does not exist. All right. Bill, uh, hold with us for a couple of minutes. Brian, another two for you before we get into some bad. I, I suppose the problem is in believing that God does exist. I mean, if you look at that scenario again, what you are asked to believe is, first of all, that this supernatural creature, God, exists and is sort of wandering around there in, in nothingness forever and ever. Uh, I come back to my child's question, where did God come from? But we leave that. Um, and then for some bizarre reason, because he is bored, lonely, uh, seeking entertainment, um, slightly sadistic, whatever, I don't know, a whole uh, game player, a huge game player, enormous dice player, thinks, hmm, this is a bit boring, wandering around here in all this emptiness, I will create the universe, and he does. And then he thinks, well, I'll go a bit further, I will create man in my own image. So you have the extraordinary vanity and arrogance of this God that comes in there, and then one has to assume that God is omniscient as well, omniscient all-powerful, and so on and so forth. There's an interesting sideline there, of course, because if God is omniscient, he is actually incapable of thought. Because if you know everything, you cannot think, because there is nothing to think about. Because to think about things, there have to be questions, and God can't have any questions. So uh, God then creates man, uh, and he knows, must know in advance, that this is going to go horribly wrong, that man is going to reject him, uh, and that it is then going to be necessary, because man has turned against him, to come down to earth in the form of a human being, to be crucified on a cross, to rise from the dead, and, and then to bring in this extraordinary uh, system where, in order to be saved from your sin, you have to, by faith, believe this, and then all will be well. And I, I just have to say, this is just all so fantastical and unbelievable and unacceptable as a system, even if you, if you do believe it, that one simply has to reject it. And, and then you have to ask, what, what is going on in God's head uh, that he says, I'm not, I'm not just going to do the ordinary thing that anyone else would do. Uh, you've got to believe in me through faith. I'm not just going to come down there and say, here I am in the middle of Atlanta or in the middle of Auckland. Look at me. You're going to have to work it out somehow for yourself and believe in me by faith. And I just say, no sensible person can really believe this. And if you come to, come to the resurrection concept, uh, it's just against everything that we know. Uh, and those are my reasons for, for not accepting it. So your argument would be that the whole invention of, uh, of God is really it's a, uh, it's a human. It's a, a human traditional, traditional atheist argument that, that man invented God in his own image. Just to keep himself happy. Uh, well, beca well, because there are these horrible unanswerable questions. I hate them as well. I would much rather believe in God. I, the idea that in, in the next 15, 20 years I'm going to die and that's the end of me is not a very palatable idea. I would prefer to believe something else. But I don't. Call it 30. 0900 That's the number to vote for Brian Edwards here in Auckland. 0900 To vote for Bill Craig in Atlanta proposing that the resurrection did occur, 0900 20223. 0900 Those lines are open. 
75 cents a call. Kids, please ask your parents first, and can I add a rider? You're voting for who's won the debate. Try not to be prejudiced by your own beliefs. Impossible. Or dispossible requests you make to people. <laughs> try not. <laughs> well, I said try not. Make an, make an effort to not to. Yeah. Can I each of you? If we, were, if we were to go back to the, the question of a person rising from the dead, and in the instance uh, of the story of Christ, as we are told, and the story of Easter, there is, as you recognize yourself, Bill, if I uh, go to you first on this one, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to make the assumption that to rise from the dead, he was actually dead. David Copperfield could have done this. So you're suggesting the apparent death theory that Jesus wasn't really dead? Is that what you're suggesting? As a possible scenario, it yeah. was a, it was a con. Well, let me mention uh, that this theory was popular during uh, the late 1700s among German rationalists, but no historian or New Testament scholar would defend this today. It's sort of the theological equivalent of the flat Earth theory. And uh, let me just quickly mention five reasons why this wouldn't work. Uh, number one, there can be absolutely no doubt medically that the crucifixion was fatal. The Romans were professional executioners, and they ensured the death of their crucified victims by a spear thrust through the heart, which Jesus received. Secondly, even if Jesus weren't dead when he was taken down, he would have died almost immediately of exposure when placed in the tomb, bleeding from open wounds in the wrists, feet, and side. Without immediate medical attention, he would have expired almost at once. Thirdly, even if he had revived, remember, he was sealed inside a tomb with a huge disc-shaped stone over it, which could not be opened from the inside. Fourth, even if he had gotten out, the appearance of a half-dead Jesus desperately in need of medical care and bandaging would hardly have elicited in the disciples the belief in him as the risen Lord and conqueror of death. Uh, and five, since Jesus knew that uh, he wasn't raised on this theory, it turns him into a charlatan, which is just a tawdry image of the great moral teacher yes. that Jesus was. So nobody defends this apparent death theory today. No, and I, no, nor would I. And I mean, I agree with that. No, we can agree at last. I, I'm quite certain that uh, uh, the disciples and the people who believed they saw Jesus were entirely sincere. Could I ask uh, you a question, Brian? Yes. Um, would you then say that these uh, facts that I've mentioned, uh, since you deny them, would you say that these are just legendary, that these are legendary fiction well, that I, uh, over uh, the years? Or, and if you yeah. do say that, how do you think this would be possible in such a short time period when the eyewitnesses were still alive? Well, I accept all the peripheral facts. I mean, I accept the putting in the tomb and all the rest of it. What I, what I don't accept is the rising from the dead. I mean, that's the, that's the one bit I don't accept. Right, I understand uh, that. But I mean, like, the empty tomb and the, the well, appearances. You don't, do you or do you not accept these those? These people were uh, deluded. They were deluded. Okay, they, be so they believed what they desperately wanted to believe, desperately needed, yeah. needed to believe. And, and you've got a bit of a problem now, Bill, it seems to me, uh, in that such a significant proportion of... The Christian world no longer believes in the literal resurrection. I mean, if you—I don't know what it's like in Atlanta, but if you come to Auck, come to Auckland, you would find. I suspect that in maybe 40, 50 percent of the Christian churches, people are saying, "Well, we don't really believe this anymore." Of course, it's—it's it's just meant to be taken as symbolic, uh, and and so your your church is hugely divided on this whole subject. It has to be said, I mean, you and I are not in a competition here. We're in a, well, we're in a reasonable argument. But atheism, at least, has been consistent for as long as it's been around. All right, let me give those well, numbers again, agree. please, before, before I come back to you on that one, uh, Bill. If you believe that Brian Edwards has won this debate here this morning, 0900 222 If you believe Bill Craig has won this debate this morning, 0900 223 75 cents a call. Kids, ask your parents first. Bill. Well, I was going to say I agree 100% with what Brian says in his Life of Brian column uh, of January 27th of this year. Could I just quote that? <laughs> oh, these this questions always do research. I admire that. He, That's good. He says, deprived of the basic tenets of the Christian faith, the Protestant churches in particular have become wishy-washy institutions peddling confusing, warm, fuzzy messages of non-judging reassurance. God has been redefined out of existence. He says, although one could respect the old-time religion, 
one can have nothing but contempt for the modern liberal cleric who believes in nothing but lacks the intellectual or moral courage to toss his dog collar in the wastebasket and call himself an atheist. I agree 100%. Oh, good. <laughs> the, the Apostle Paul said that if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is futile. Our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Yeah. If he didn't rise, then Christianity is a lie, and we should just quit pretending and go yes. home. And Absolutely. Agree with Brian Absolutely. We're in total agreement about that. I mean, I think the Christians should stick to their guns, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and sadly, that is, uh, that is not happening. Could I ask you the, the question that I asked before? What, if God exists, why does God not just show himself? I mean, why, why is, it, why is it God so coy? Well, that's, very, uh, that's a good question. And I think that uh, it has to do with the prepared heart. God has revealed himself in ways that are clear and visible to those who seek him and want to know him, but which are vague enough and unclear enough so as not to compel persons whose hearts and minds are closed. And therefore, I think there are evidences of God which are there for someone who will honestly seek him with an open mind and open heart. God has revealed in the handiwork of nature, in the beauty and design of nature, in the moral law written on our heart, and preeminently in Scripture, in the Bible, and of course in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, that God raised him from the dead as evidence of uh, his divinity and his claim. So I think for the person who's willing to look at it with an open mind and heart, that this evidence is sufficient. But it won't compel someone whose mind is closed. That's very true. Do you, you think I have a closed mind? Do I? Yes. Well, yeah, because I, I, I must come into that category by your definition. Well, I, I think it is because you're, you're as I said earlier and, and asked you, what would it take to convince you? And I don't think there's any amount of historical evidence that could convince you that a miracle has occurred in the past because you're, you've got your mind made up that God doesn't exist. An interesting area that you have mentioned once or twice here is the area of, of moral values or conscience. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's your view, as I understand it, that our, our morality, our conscience, if you like, comes, comes from God. And th this has always seemed to me to be quite incorrect, that our, our conscience, it seems to me, is a, is a social device uh, mm -hmm. that, we, that has gradually been grown over the years. It always seemed to me that if, if conscience came from God, there ought to be a universal conscience that would be the same in more or less in all of us. We might ignore it and do bad things, but the conscience right. would be there. But this is quite clearly not true. If you look at New Zealand society, for example, the Maori in New Zealand were cannibals. Uh, when the Europeans first arrived here, they didn't feel bad about killing people. They didn't feel bad about cooking and eating them. So a conscience was clearly not universal until the arrival of the Europeans. Let, let me make two points. First, that's not my primary argument. What my argument is, and I'd be interested to know whether Brian agrees with this or not, is that if God does not exist as a basis for transcendent and objective moral values, then it seems to me that moral values are nothing more than socio-culturally relative yes. mores that have evolved through sociobiological evolution and have no objective transcultural validity. Yeah. Now. That's my main argument. Yeah, and I agree with that argument. That's, oh, that, right. that's correct. There, are no, okay. there, is, there is no objective morality. There is oh. only subjective morality. And even if uh, we thought morality came from God, it would still be subjective. It would be God's subjective morality. The only difference between God and, and, and the police or the state is that God has a bigger stick. And does not the spread of uh, morality across cultures across the world uh, reinforce that idea that there is no universal morality? There is no universal morality. Well, we've, we've come so to generally agreed norms, haven't we? That this is good and this is bad, but that's as far as you can go. between universal and objective. Uh, a morality needn't be universal to be objective. There can always be persons who fail to discern moral values correctly. But what you're saying, Brian, implies, for example, just to be clear, that you don't think that there was anything morally wrong with the Holocaust or with rape or child abuse, that these are just socially inconvenient in those cultures but there isn't any objective right or wrong about these things there, there is find the, incredible well um but yeah, that's to advance a highly emotive argument there isn't of course i believe it is of course it, of course but, I, but, I, well hold on let me finish because that's a serious thing you said uh, right. of course i believe the hol holocaust was the most dreadful thing that child abuse is dreadful that rape is dreadful all of those sorts of things but what i'm saying is that that is, that is a conditioned social view. It is very strongly my view that those things are, are, are awful things to, to happen. But what, all I'm saying is that there is no 
objective morality. There is no such thing. We decide that some yeah. things are wrong and some things yeah, are right. So we really don't... Bill, it seems to me that we have your God is the only God from, from you. And from Brian, we have there is no God, any God at all. No evidence of God. Well, I, I, I don't like to use the language of my God. I mean, God isn't anybody's property. I'm his, not the other way around. But, but to, to, to speak to this moral question, on Brian's view, it, it means that there's nothing objectively morally wrong with child abuse. That the child abuser or the pedophile doesn't do anything morally wrong in hurting his no, no, I mean, and you know that I would never would never argue well, but that. Well, no, you, you look, you've got to separate day to day. You can't live with your world view. No, no, no. You have, you have to separate philosophical questions, yeah. and this is a philosophical question, from the realities of everyday life. Uh, for example, I'm a determinist. I don't believe we have free will. But you can't possibly live by that. You have to assume that you are, you know, responsible for your actions. Everyday life. We have a winner at uh, the end of uh, telephone voting, and we thank you for your vote. We have two thousand and one dollars, uh, which uh, we are able to give to uh, charity, and um, we would invite you, Bill, to nominate the charity that you wish the two thousand and one dollars that you've won uh, to go to. Well, thank you very much. Hey, congratulations, Bill. <laughs> well, thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. You I'll, put I'll, up I'll... a fine fight, Brian, if I may say so. <laughs> very uh, fine. I must say, Maybe there's a bit of prejudice out there in the audience. I don't know. Well, perhaps, although I do think the preponderance of evidence support Christian theism, and, and I, I want you, Brian, to, to, to take another look at it, you know, in your own life, to... To, to do some more reading in, in some of these areas because very I think there's really very good evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you nominate, uh, Bill, as well, the recipient? I, I, was, I, I love to work with university students because it was at about that age that I came to become a Christian. And so I would like uh, the money to go to New Zealand Campus Crusade for Christ. All right. Uh, we're very grateful to you for uh, joining us from Atlanta, Georgia uh, this morning. It's been most enjoyable uh, for those of us uh, listening here. And once again, congratulations. Yeah, and, uh, yes, well done. I enjoyed talking to you. Uh, I enjoyed well, it too, Brian, yes. very much. And Brian Edwards uh, in Auckland, uh, once again, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, Sam. Uh, for what I found a most engrossing uh, listen, a challenging uh, listen. You put up some damn fine uh, arguments. Gave it a darn good shot. Ah. Yeah, very best. We are one minute away from uh, midday, so my thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Brian Edwards here in Auckland, Dr. Bill Craig in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, technical director Pat and uh, producer Phil Guy, and thanks to New Zealand On Air uh, for helping to make the program possible, and to friends and supporters of CBA throughout New Zealand, News Talk ZB uh, for having the courage to broadcast this debate. Well, it was a quiet day, and everybody who voted most of all you for listening, have a cracking day. Today's Easter special has been produced by CBA with help from supporters throughout the country and New Zealand on air.